Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Once upon a time, war had structure. There was a kind of narrative arc to conflict, a beginning, a middle, and a clear end. In the modern era, certainly since Vietnam, they have become what Clausewitz called protracted conflict. Even the efforts to find resolution are nothing more than wars by other means. Most of you have heard the biblical quote that you will hear of wars and rumors of war, but be not alarmed. These things must happen, but the end is still to come. With respect to American efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan, the end is still to come. Few understand that better than the men and women who serve there, and few articulate it better than my guest, Elliot Ackerman. Elliot Ackerman served multiple tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was a recipient of the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart, and is the author of several award-winning novels, including Dark at the Crossing, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and most recently, Waiting for Eden. It is my pleasure to welcome Elliot Ackerman here to talk about his newest work, Places and Names on War, Revolution, and Returning. Elliot Ackerman, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Well, it's great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about your state of mind, where you were when you enlisted. What was what was the reason? What was your thought process at the time? Um, well, I came into the Marine Corps uh, before September 11th. Uh, I did ROTC in college, and uh, you know, I, I joined for probably the confluence of, of three forces. One being I, I grew up overseas, so I think I uh, always viewed America from kind of one step removed, and it made me give a context to what it meant to be an American and made me want to give something back. And I'd say the second was uh, I wanted a job where, I, where whether I was good at my job or bad at my job uh, had real consequences, and I wanted a real responsibility, and I could think of nowhere else except for the Marine Corps where they would put me in charge of 45 people when I was 23 years old. And, um, you know, lastly, I was that kid who never stopped playing with his G.I. Joes. So I think, you know, all three of those led me into the military. And then you know, it just so happened the time in which I served was uh, was one when, when it was wartime. One of the things you talk about is the value of purpose and what war does in terms of purpose. To what extent did you think about that when you first went into the Marines and, and a little bit about how that idea evolved for you? Well, you know, I. As I mentioned, you know, one of these forces that was driving me into the Marines was desire to, you know, to matter to whether or not I was good at my job or bad at my job to have that really matter. Um, and I think uh, as a journalist, too, uh, I still feel that uh, that sense of purpose and that, you know, I want to be present at the events that are defining the time in which I live. But I think that something that happens to any young person when they join the military and particularly in wartime is you know you wind up developing I would say almost kind of like a dysfunctional relationship with purpose, in so much, you know if purpose is if we derive our happiness from purpose, you could say that if purpose is like the drug that induces happiness and meaning in our lives, when a young person goes to war, they wind up, uh, they wind up taking kind of the most intense form of purpose you could take. So if purpose is a drug, it's like they're freebasing the crystal meth of purpose starting at 19 or 20 years old. And eventually, you know, you do that for five, six, seven, eight years, you come home. And when you come home, you have to repurpose yourself and find more, another different meaning in your life. And I think that can be a real challenge for, for veterans. How does that sense of, of purpose and the drug of purpose, as you brilliantly describe it, how does that play out during time at war when, when there is a certain or seeming certain futility to the effort, when the results are not crystal clear and that sense of purpose is still there? Talk about how that disconnect plays itself out. Well, I think it, there is a disconnect because, you know, there isn't – when you're involved in, in war, there isn't a futility in the effort because the effort feels very personal. You know, it's, it's keeping yourself safe, keeping your buddy alive, doing all of those things, although there can be a real seeming futility to the policy and the policies that you're fighting for. So I think it's important to disintermediate those two because oftentimes they're conflated um, as though – the specific things, the specific combat, the specific things people are doing for, for one another are futile, when in fact it's really the policies that are, that are futile. Mm -hmm. One of the things you talk about is, is and, and it's part of the title of the book, this, this sense of place, the importance of place, and the connection to that. Is that an idea that you came to later on, or did you have a sense of that 
during your years of combat there? I think you have a sense of it, but you know, you 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 know, you walk away. You have a sense of it when you're there, but you walk away, and I think I think it becomes more profound, um, and you only understand the experiences and what they really meant through the prism of time. Um, I can remember, you know, many moments in combat where you know someone would be having a hard time. Um, the refrain, you know, I would say this, and I would say this, would be like, "Listen, you can't think about what's going on right now. Right now, we just have to get through today." And you will have the rest of your life to think about today. And that's really true. And I think that um, the places where you fight kind of become the, 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 become the where you can return to and where you're often returning to in your mind, even if you're not physically returning to those places. And those places become very significant. You have this scene in the book where you and, – and, and I'm jumping ahead here – but when you're having that lunch with, with Abu Hassan, where you pull out that map or you draw that map and you, you pick place to place to place, talk a little bit about that, because that really accentuates this importance of place. Sure. Well, one of the, you know, one of the early scenes of the book is um, I'm, I'm reporting on the war in Syria, and I have the opportunity to sit down with uh, a former member of al-Qaeda in Iraq. And um, the two of us set up a meeting, and, you know, we're two veterans of the Iraq war that we, we fought on opposite sides of the war. And, um, you know, I had a real curiosity about him because he had been on one side of a conflict that had really been defining for me. And I sort of took a, a guess that he would have an equal curiosity about me, which proved to be the case. So we wind up having this wide-ranging conversation, and about four hours into it, a friend of mine who was interpreting for us basically gets tired, and he says, I need a break. And so he leaves the table. And suddenly, Abu Hassar and I, as intensely as we've been talking, we can't communicate. And uh, the, our conversation kind of becomes as awkward as two 13-year-olds on their first date. You know, we're sort of staring at our hands. And he then takes a sheet of paper and he draws a diagonal line from one corner to the other. And that line basically represented the Euphrates River. And then he writes down uh, a name next to a spot on the river and he puts a date next to it. And he hands me the pencil. Um, and I'm like, okay, I understand what he's doing. And I put mine number next to his number and then he takes another place and another number and i do another number next to his and sort of as we once chased each other around the country our hands start chasing each other around the map and we're writing down places and dates to see if any of the dates lined up and we've been fighting at the same place at the same time you know that was a language that even if our interpreter had been there he would not have been able to translate and it was just a language of, of places and dates and names and those things are they, they, they transcend language, and they're, they're irrefutable. The other part of that, the other subtext to that, is this sense of, of understanding who the enemy is, who it is that, that you're fighting out there, this faceless, nameless enemy on the other side. Well, it's wanting to understand them and, and acknowledge the fact that uh, as much as war is about dehumanizing your enemy, probably peace and ending a war is to is to rehumanize them and i think he and i you know we we fought against one another when we were young men and we were still relatively young but now we're you know in our mid-30s and we're both fathers and there's this curiosity as who is this person who defined me and what, what i discovered with him is as much as politically we still disagreed about many many things and had radically different views of the world there was this almost surprising deep commonality we had had, and it was rooted in this shared experience. So that I would tell you, you know, because we had that shared experience of, of fighting in the same war, you know, I feel today there's, you know, I have more in common with Abu Hassar than I do with many of the people I grew up with. To what extent did the Vietnam experience and, and some of the things that, that came out of that, to what extent did that inform your views about all of this, either as a young man or as you, you aged in this whole story? Well, you know, when I was growing up, Vietnam was the last war, and so what I understood of contemporary warfare was the, was the Vietnam experience. And going into the Marines, I read a lot of books, um, you know, books like a novel like Fields of Fire by Jim Webb or The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. And before I had experienced myself, this was how I gained whatever my nascent understanding was of war. What was interesting to me was to go back after I had fought and to return to those books and read them again and uh, and read them differently a second time. You know, there are things in the book that I, I, I – those books that I didn't really understand. But I think what happens with any wars, the people who, who fight and the people who participate – 
you know, we become kind of we become the custodians of, of what is a sort of a sacred memory. And um, and I know that I deeply valued those books and the books written by the Vietnam generation. Um, and, you know, I've been hardened to see uh, that my generation of veterans has, has written about their own experience. And, and I hope if, you know, if if we are probably we'll probably at some point in the future find ourselves in a position where we are contemplating war again. And um, as unfortunate that it, as that is, you know, I, I hope that people will be able to look back at what's been written of these wars and have at least some understanding of, of what it means to go to war. What was different when you went back to read these Vietnam era books? That I un- I just understood them. I you know, if you're reading a book about a book like Fields of Fire, that's all about a Marine rifle platoon. There would be you know dynamics in the book that that Webb would write about social dynamics or tensions between a squad leader and you know and I read it the first time and noted it but then I'd read it the second time and it would just really ring true to me because it would be echoing off some experience that I had had so I would just say I understood them maybe with a depth that I didn't understand them before. Talk about your decision to go back there twelve years after you left as a journalist. Talk a little bit about that experience. I think one of the things that's been, you know, interesting and somewhat unique about these wars, as opposed to a, a Vietnam or the Second World War, is that they they haven't really they haven't ended. Right. You know, we declared Iraq over in 2011, but clearly it wasn't over with the rise of the Islamic State and the fighting that's gone on there since. And the Afghan War is still not over. So, going back for me as a journalist was in some ways wanting to re-engage with a story that I knew wasn't done. Um, as opposed to, you know, we often see veterans going back to wars when they are done for a sense of closure. You know, it was impossible to have any type of sense of closure because the conflict was ongoing. And, um, you know, that, again, that's what's made these wars unique. And I think it's made it unique for this generation of veterans because each of us who's left the war and gone on to do other things in life, you know, we've had to declare our own separate peace. We basically had to each individually say that the war is over for us, as opposed to in the past when the war has been clearly clearly finished politically how difficult was that how difficult was it for you to come to that that personal piece and how different was it for other veterans that you've talked to well i can't speak for all other veterans i'll I'll speak for myself i think it's very difficult because you know the war becomes very personal i mean you're living in that world you're going deployment to deployment you're the people you're deploying with are some of your best friends and each time you come home the question exists of are you going to go on the next deployment? Are you going to be there for the next one? And leaving the war ultimately means you have to look at your best friend and say, I know some of you are going on this next deployment and are going to be putting yourselves in harm's way, but I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm finished and I want to move on. And, um, you know, that can, be a, that can be very complicated. How tough was that decision for you to finally say you were done? Um, it was it was it was very difficult. Uh, it was uh, there was a lot of conflicting emotion in that, and wanting to feel like you were present for the people, you know, your your friends who've done so much for you, who are continuing on with that life, um, but knowing that there were other things in your life that you wanted to do. Um, you know, specific to me, it, you know, it almost cost me my best friend. Talk about going back to and, and again coming back to this idea of places, going back to some place like Fallujah and what that was like when you went back there as a journalist. Well, I think the, what was most remarkable to me was that the city itself had changed so little. Um, you know, I fought in the second battle of Fallujah. By the time I went back, the third battle of Fallujah had already been fought. So to go and stand, I wanted to stand and go to some very specific places where I had memories of, of battles I'd fought in that were, that were very difficult. And what was remarkable was to stand there 12 years later, unknowing how much I had changed and how much had, my life had reshaped itself, and to stand on the little you know, patch of dirt or, or stare down an alleyway I'd had to fight down and see that that place was exactly the same and hadn't changed at all uh, was surreal. There's there's almost a kind of time travel element to it in that you have this sense that you've changed so much, but yet the place where you stand and the reality of that place has been stuck in a kind of time warp in some respects. Well, I think that's really true. You know, when I when I when I went back, um, you know, I was being escorted around the city by a few Iraqi police, uh, you know, who just knew I was a journalist and I wasn't going to tell them, you know, exactly why I'd been there. It's, you know, visiting Fallujah, if you were a Marine, 
who fought there in 2004, I'd say it's sort of like visiting New Orleans if your name is Hurricane <laughs> Katrina. You know, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a fraught proposition. But at one point they figured it out because the places I wanted to go to were these sort of obscure places. It didn't it didn't make any sense why an American would want to go to this specific street corner or this specific building. And one of them who I kind of built a little rapport with, I you know I told him towards the end of the day, I said, you know, I fought here 12 years ago, and he sort of smiled and he looked at me. He said, well, you know, is it as you remembered it? And I didn't know how to describe that because I had spent so much time remembering and thinking about those places, you know, every, you know, basically every day thinking about them. So, um, so you know, memory changes and, and bends and uh, and going back, there is that sense of time travel and, and surreality. How much was what you saw when you went back, the way you remembered it when you finally saw it, but but what tricks did memory play over those 12 years? How did that memory shift and morph in your own imagination? Well, I think you go to a place and the you know these places have sort of a sense of what they feel like, you smell like and uh and and little details you remember. And that was all very much present. You know, I remember I, I wanted to go to a, a building that my platoon had found itself. We found ourselves surrounded in a building for a day. And it, was a, it was some of the toughest fighting we were involved in. And um, at one point, the, there was only one doorway into this building, and there was a machine gun on it, an enemy machine gun on it. And we couldn't go out this door. So the way we had to get out of the building was we put a bunch of explosives inside the very building we were in. And blew out the back wall so we could run out this black wall where no one was covering. And I remember after we did that, I found myself with my radio operator uh, pinned down behind a little cinder block ledge. It was probably a, eight cinder blocks piled up, and we were pinned down there for probably 20 minutes. And it was uh, you know, pretty terrifying, bullets kicking up all around us. We didn't know how we were going to get moving again. And when I went back 12 years later, I went to that building we'd been surrounded in as I stood on the roof. And, you know, sure enough, there were those eight little cinder blocks still sitting there. And I remembered them exactly. And they hadn't moved. They hadn't changed. They were just a little pile of rubble. Um, and I was really struck by that, how, how, despite how despite how much I changed, those little cinder blocks were still there. Talk a little bit about the war itself and, and, and what you understood and, mis- and, and realized later that you misunderstood about the reality of, of the enemy that you were fighting there. You know, I'm. You might call me an optimist. I I believe that all of us, no matter how different we are, ultimately we have more in common than we have different. And that, um, you know, that includes the people that you fought against and the reasons why you were fighting. And so, um, you know, as was the case with Abu Assar, you know, he and I have many, many places where we are ideologically and politically different. But the the one thing we shared was that the defining event of our lives was the Iraq War. And that was a common ground where we could meet to not only discuss the war, but to discuss everything from, you know, the job he was working to his hopes for his kids to the challenges he was facing with his extended family. Um, And ultimately, to me, the, you know, the acknowledgement that we do have these similarities is, you know, that that I think is where we know where you start making peace. You, you mentioned before that in many ways you realized that, that in, in some ways at least you had more in common with him than some of the people back home. Talk a little bit about what you encountered when you returned, the questions you were asked, and, 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 and sort of the misunderstanding that so many people had about what was happening there. Well, you know, I think what's been interesting about these wars is, you know, we fought them with an all-volunteer military, and we funded them through deficit spending, so no one's been taxed. And so uh, for many Americans, through no fault of their own, but they just they haven't been asked to be engaged with these wars. And I think that's one of the reasons they've gone on so long. I mean, this year, 2001, this marks a, a first in our country's history. It's the first time that someone can go enlist in a war that's older than they are. So you can enlist and go fight in a war that's older than you are. That's never happened before in this country. But, you know, coming home, I, you know, people are always, I have always, I think, wished me well, wanted to, and, you know, and wanted to, you know, do their best to understand. Um, and sometimes that's done well. I mean, one thing that has that surprised me since I, when I came home was, you know, how many people, strangers would ask me if I'd ever killed anyone. 
which I thought was a very personal question, and I at first didn't really know how to answer it. And, uh, you know, eventually I, I took to answering and saying if someone asked me if I killed someone, I would say, well, if I did, you paid me to. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, again, we, we, go to, we go to war as a country. And uh, if you're a taxpayer, you know, ultimately, you know, your taxes do go to, go to fund our government. And so you pay me to. Um, but uh, that answer ultimately really wasn't sufficient because one of the first people to ever ask me the question of whether or not I killed anyone was my uh, cousin. And she was six years old. And she doesn't pay taxes. So, um, you know, ultimately, the book is called Places and Names on War, Revolution, and Returning. And the trickiest word in that title is Returning. Um, because you're both returning home, but then there's also this draw to return back to the war to understand what it all meant. How strong is that pull to return back when you first come home? Well, I think it's pretty strong, and it, it depends on how you return. I think some people return in memory. You know, there are other people like me who return physically, and I think with these wars, because they've gone on so long, there is the opportunity to return physically to places like Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan. I mean, they are actually just a plane right away. Um, but I think the pull is strong and whenever I've traveled around the war zone and I, you know, I inevitably meet people, you know, other journalists, photographers, humanitarian aid workers, and, you know, it doesn't take you long to realize that most of them have got some history in the war that they've come back, um, uh, because of that draw. And, uh, and because for them, I think it's, it becomes the defining event of your life. Um, you know, people have asked me in the past, you know, hey, Elliot, how do you think the war has changed you? And I've never known how to answer that question because in so many ways the war made me. Um, I don't uh, – it's, so, it's such a central experience to who I am that I, 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 you know, the last time I wasn't engaged with it, I was 17 years old. And I can't, I can't tell you how I've changed since I was 17 years old. And was it a different experience? I mean, you didn't have this experience, but from those you've talked to, was was it a different experience for those that came to the war later in life, for those that, that were older? Um, I, you know, yes and no. I mean, listen, I think each person is different, but I think that uh, probably when you're older, you know, for instance, if you were like a career military right. officer who wound up in the wars at an older age, it, it might feel differently than if you're much younger. And I think the impact for people who are younger is probably a little bit more profound. Mm -hmm. Talk about this idea that that the war made you in many ways. And and, and it's really not how much you've changed, but how your life might have been different if you had not gone into war or if you had done something else. Well, you know, it, it's like there are, um, it's you know, if who we, if who we are as people is like a, you know, a fabric. Let's say there's just you know, it's all woven together with these many, many different strands. Um, it's difficult for me to say which strands are the war and which strands aren't the war, and to try to untangle that piece of fabric. Um, I can't because I, I don't. I, I no longer can see what is and is not the war because I only see, you know, the ultimate person that I am, that ultimate piece of fabric. Um, that's what I mean by, you know, by it, 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 the war made me, and that, um, you know, it's it, it, it's been the central. It, it has been the central experience of my life, meaning not just Iraq in 2004, but Iraq in 2004, then deploying to Afghanistan, then working in Syria as a journalist. You know, these conflicts have been the central through line of what I've done in my work. Mm-hmm. And in many ways, it, it's the way you write places and names, this very kind of impressionistic way that, that really weaves this fabric together that you're talking about. It does. I mean, and, and it is. The book is impressionistic. You know, I would say if the book has a shape, it's not a linear shape you know, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's it's sort of circular. It's like I'm drawing a circumference of a circle in this book. And obviously, like any circle, every point on the circumference is different. It's all these different points. But the one thing that each point on the circumference has in common, just like with a circle, is a center point. There's this common center point. And so as you're traveling with me around Iraq and around Syria and into Turkey, this common center point is my own wartime experience, so what makes the books a memoir. And I'm taking this journey, looking at that experience from 10 years ago from every possible angle as I travel the circumference of this circle around it. Elliot Ackerman, the book is Places and Names on War, Revolution, and Returning. Elliot, I thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you.